Good morning, boys and girls. Thank you so much for coming up here today. I have a question for you, and that is, what do you do to show someone that you love them? We just had Valentine's Day a couple weeks ago, and I'd like to know, what do you do to show someone that you love them? Give them a hug. Okay, that's a good answer. I'll make a Valentine's card for them. That would be really cool. Help them. Okay. Yes. Play with them. Yeah. Spend time with them. Yeah. Those are all great ways to show that we love somebody and that we care about them. I mean, that's how you show that you love you know, maybe your brothers and your sisters. That's how you show that you, you like your, your classmates. That's a lot of the ways that your parents uh, show that they love you too, isn't it? All right? So if somebody didn't do those things and they said you love, they loved you, do you think you would believe them? If they just said they loved you, but they never actually showed that they loved you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, hopefully, you know, you would still believe them. Hopefully they would still love you. Maybe they don't have time or something. I, I don't know. You know, there's lots of different things that can happen there. But when you love somebody, then you want to do what you can to show that you love them, uh, don't you? And you use all of the different ways that you, you can do that. Okay? Well, I, I'm curious. Do you think that we have done those things to, to show that we love God? Yeah. What kind of things do we do to show that we love God? Do you think? Pray, yeah. By praying, we show that we, we hope that God will give what we're asking for. We go to church. We spend time with him uh, in, in worship to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we know that God forgives our sins, and so we trust his love for us. You know, that's part of something we do. Okay. Um, yeah. Ah, we celebrate Christmas. Yeah, we celebrate his birthday, um, and we thank him for coming to be with us. That's, that's very important, too. Do we always show God that we love him, or there are sometimes when we kind of think, well, maybe I love myself more than I love God? You know, that happens, too. Sometimes, sometimes that happens with our parents, right? Sometimes we, we want to do the things that we want to do instead of the parent, things our parents tell us to do. It happens the same way with God, too. Sometimes we do the things that we want to do rather than the things that God wants us to do. And that's why Paul talks about, in the reading that we just heard from Romans, um, about how wonderful it was that God died for, that Jesus came and died for us. Right? And Paul says here that we were God's enemies, and Jesus still came and died for us. If somebody was your enemy, would you do things to them to show that you love them? Would you give them a hug if somebody had just been mean to you? Would you want to play with them if somebody had said something mean to you? Would you give them a valentine if they'd pushed you? Well, maybe not. But that's what God did for us. And here, take a look at this. Paul says this, But God shows his love for us in this, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So even though we weren't showing that we loved God, even though we weren't doing the things that God wanted us to do, Jesus still came and died for us. I want you to take a look at this, this little thing of, of Jesus on the cross here. Where, where are Jesus' arms? They're stretched out, aren't they? They're stretched out. Kind of like he's about to give the world a big hug. Like he's about to give you a big hug. You know, uh, you, When you look at Jesus and you see him on the cross like that, you can see there, there's the proof that God loves you. You know, there's the, the one thing to, you know, because we're going to go through life and we're going to wonder sometimes, you know, I wonder if God loves me or not. You know, maybe this is a really hard thing that's happening to me. Or maybe I don't feel like anybody else loves me. Maybe God doesn't love me either. Well, here's, here's the proof that God does love us. Here's the proof that we can, we can uh, hold on to and know all throughout our life. Here, Jesus was willing to die for us, and not just to die for us, but then to rise again from the dead. Then we know God loves us. And we don't have to worry about the other things that are happening because we know that God loves us and will take care of us uh, then too, okay? All right. Well, thank you guys. Let's go ahead and pray and ask that, that uh, God would help us to show that love to other people too, all right? So I'll pray, and why don't you guys follow along in your hearts, okay? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for coming and showing God's love for us that even when we didn't love you, you came and you loved us. Uh, we thank you for your love and that in your death you stretch out your hands to give all of us a hug and to uh, show us your love there. We pray that we would always see your love 
for us in that wonderful act that you did for us. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text we'll consider is the gospel reading from Mark chapter 8. Listen again to these words of Jesus. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. In the name of Jesus, who has given everything for you, dear fellow redeemed. We are very proud of who we are. Many of us have spent quite a long time, decades perhaps even, improving our situation, our reputation, and our standing in life. Our culture, the natural psyche, and our entire advertising industry has told us to, to, to pursue our own goals, to go after our dreams, and to do whatever feels the best to us. So, look at what Jesus tells us then today and see if it fits. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We love ourselves. How dare Jesus ask us to give up who we are and die. But if we're going to follow Jesus to the cross, then there might just be some suffering on our part as well. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. This is the first of three times that Jesus is going to lead his disciples through what becomes sort of a cycle that repeats itself again and again. Jesus will predict his death and his resurrection, and then his disciples, one or a group of them, are going to say something or do something that, well, let's just say they'll later regret doing. Jesus will rebuke them for it, and then Jesus will use it as an opportunity to, to teach them what it really means to follow him. So here, Jesus has just done that for the first time. He's told his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem to suffer and die and then rise again. And then Peter turns him around, rebukes him, and then Jesus rebukes Peter, and then Jesus teaches us this about following him and taking up the cross. And Mark tells the account of Jesus this way, and so we have this thing repeating itself in chapter 8, in chapter 9, and then again in chapter 10. And Mark does it that way to highlight this, uh, these incidents. So today we want to focus on what Jesus teaches us in response to Peter's rebuke. Instead of fleeing the cross, we're going to see Jesus go towards it, take it boldly, and die willingly for us. And as we look at this, we'll see how Jesus helps us to take up our cross and follow him. So again, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, what does it mean to deny yourself? Since Jesus is asking us to deny ourselves and to follow him, let's look at what this meant for Jesus. A wonderful passage of scripture to explain this comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, where Paul says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Taking the very form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As God the Father is equal from all eternity, Jesus had all power, all honor and glory on his own, and yet he didn't consider it worth hanging on to. He gave it up willingly for you. He came and was born in a lowly manner. His crib is a manger. His parents are poor. But even that was not enough to save you. He went even further, suffering the most despicable death imaginable, death on a cross. Jesus was glad to go there because it meant saving you. For Jesus, humbling himself meant leaving God's right hand that no one would recognize, no one would see who he truly was other than through the miracles or through events like the transfiguration. In this passage, Paul's words fit very well with what Jesus says here. He says, have this same mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus that here Jesus has humbled himself, and so part of our self-denial, part of our denying ourselves, is 
doing that same thing, humbling ourselves and thinking better of other people. The people who heard Jesus say these words, both the people who were there as Jesus spoke these words to them on the way to Caesarea Philippi, and the first people who read Mark's gospel would have heard these words in a little bit different way. Because taking up your cross and following meant something a little bit different. For the first three centuries after Jesus was, after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, Crucifixion was one of the ways that Christians often gave their life for their faith. We know that this was the way the Romans really liked to punish those who were rebels, those who were runaway slaves, and those who were criminals. And so stories tell us that many of Jesus' disciples, many of the people who heard Jesus say these words, were asked to do exactly that, to take up a cross and go and die somewhere. Stories tell us, and we have no reason to believe otherwise, that Peter even asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy of dying in the same way that Jesus did. 300 years later, the Roman Empire would make it, Ill make it legal to be a Christian and stop crucifying people. But Christians still from time to time have been forced to do the same thing, to literally carry a cross and go die on it. Persecution has gone out throughout the whole Christian whole history of the Christian faith, but a few times it really has come down to this people dying on crosses. In 1597, there were Japanese Christians in the city of Nagasaki who were crucified because of their faith in Jesus. We've seen this more recently in Syria and Iraq as ISIS has done the same thing, nailing people to crosses for their faith in Christ. And here, look at what Jesus says. He says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. All of these people, all of these martyrs, had the chance to renounce their faith, to give it up and live. But they considered eternal life with Christ far more valuable than anything this world had to offer. So rather than deny their Lord, they gave their lives freely because Jesus had given his life for them. If this is what it looked like for Jesus and for his disciples and what it's looked like for so many Christians throughout the history of his church, what does it look like then for us? Well, the biggest difference is that we don't live in a place where our life is being threatened because we belong to Jesus, and you would think that that would make things easier. But does it really? Hopefully none of us will ever be asked to actually carry a cross out to a hill somewhere and be nailed to it and die for our faith. But what we're asked to do daily is to daily deny ourselves and follow Jesus. And this may be just as hard because instead of someone else crucifying you, this is you crucifying yourself. Paul says in Galatians 5.24, all those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now for you, this happened in the water of holy baptism. There God took all of the evil and all of the selfishness and all of the sin inside you and drowned it there with Jesus. Your sins were nailed to the cross there with him as you were united with Christ in his death. And each day you rise again, ready to serve God and your neighbor because Christ is risen from the dead for you. Denying yourself sounds really hard, but it's not something we're unfamiliar with. We're asked to deny ourselves daily in our marriage and in our lives with our families. Marriage and family life is one of the greatest, most maybe the most underrated way that we have of growing in our Christian faith. One of the things that we talk about in counseling before a couple gets married is a different definition of love. Love is an emotion, and usually that's the way that we think of it, but emotions come and go, and so love needs to be more than just an emotion. Instead, we think of love as a choice. See, no matter how you feel in the morning, when you get up, you have to choose to love your family. When you choose instead to be unloving to your family, things will go wrong, and they will go wrong very quickly. Well, we show what we value by how we spend our time and by how we spend our money. And sometimes it is very easy to spend all of our time and all of our money on ourselves. Giving our time and our money for someone else 
is a form of self-denial. Marriage and family life is supposed to work this way, of course. If you're going to live with other people, then there'll be certain times when you need to think of them before you think of yourself and spend your money on them before you spend your money on yourself. Spend your time on them before you spend your time on yourself. So we are, to a certain degree, used to doing this towards our families. And so Jesus calls us to do this towards him and even to do this for him before we do it to our own family. And in fact, the two kind of work together because in showing our love for our family, quite often we're showing our love for him. So the time that you spend together with your kids, changing their diapers, rolling around on the floor with them, is worth more than trying to promote yourself. The energy you spend building up your husband or your wife will be far more fruitful than time spent on yourself. The money that you give to your church or to help those who are in need will show that you trust the Lord more than you trust the money that he has given to you. For Jesus says here, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? When you are asked to do something that is hard, it can become very easy when you remember that the person who is asking you to do it loves you. If you see that hard thing as an act of love towards someone who has loved you first, then you will do it gladly. And so Jesus here is asking us to deny ourselves, and we know he loves us. We have seen his love for us. We know that he has died for us. We know that he continually gives us forgiveness. That even in the Lord's Supper here, he gives us his own body, his own blood for the forgiveness of sins each and every time we come. He has borne the weight of all of our selfishness, of all of our sin, and has taken it on himself. Because instead of killing us, it has killed him. So Jesus says, For what can a man give in return for his life? Well, nothing. That's the short answer. There's nothing that you can give in return for your life. You can't give anything in exchange for yourself. But that's the lie we'd like to believe. We want to think that there's something that I can bring to the bargaining table with God. Maybe if I do enough, maybe if I'm a good enough parent, maybe if I'm a good enough friend, then God will give me something in return. Maybe if I give all my money away, then God will give me even more back. Well, he might, but there's no guarantee. No, we can't give anything in exchange for our soul. But Jesus can, and Jesus did. He has given you everything. If you want to see what God thinks of you, you look at Jesus there on the cross. God shows his love for us in this, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Your sins are forgiven because Jesus died for you. And that's why Jesus calls us to be willing to give up everything that makes us who we are, our wants, our needs, our values, our house, our home, our family, our friends, maybe our political affiliation or our sex lives. The way that we spend our time and money, we may be called to leave any one of these things behind because Jesus has a way of doing it better. Because some of those things sometimes come between us and the Lord, and that will not be good. So carrying our cross does not have anything to do with how strong we are, but how willing we are to follow where Jesus leads us. And if Jesus is leading us, then we are willing to go wherever he calls us to go. We know that he went to the cross, but then rose from the dead for us. Whatever Jesus calls us to suffer, whatever he calls us to endure, we know the glory that is on the other side. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.